Good afternoon and welcome to this proceedings release webinar. I am April Melvin and I'm one of the study directors for the workshop that we'll be discussing today. Last September, the National Academies held a three-day workshop that examined approaches to integrating public and ecosystem health systems to foster resilience and to identify research that can help bridge the gap between knowledge and action. This workshop brought together research, practitioner, and policy communities, along with other stakeholders, and explored the opportunities and challenges around this topic. This activity was supported by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. I'd like to acknowledge that the National Academy's Washington DC office is physically housed on the traditional lands of the Nkonshtank and Piscataway peoples past and present. We honored with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations and the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples, nations, and this land. We also acknowledge that our understanding of global change is closely related to and informed by indigenous knowledge and experience, and that many native communities are on the front line of impacts from these changes. Workshop participants reflected on the connections between land and people and on the inequities and challenges that different communities face in sustaining this connection and in their pursuit of health. In the months following the workshop, a proceedings was developed. This document summarizes the presentations and discussions at the event and does not include any formal recommendations or conclusions on this topic. The proceedings was released a few weeks ago. You can find the link to view and download it free of charge in the chat or using the QR code on your screen. And we'll put this up again at the end of the workshop. For today's discussion, we are joined by a few members of the workshop planning committee. They include Kathleen Rest from the Boston University Institute for Global Sustainability, who was the chair of the workshop planning committee. Jonathan Sleeman with the US Geological Survey National Wildlife Health Center, and Albert Coe with the Yale School of Public Health and Brazilian Ministry of Health. Kathleen will lead us in an overview of the workshop and share some of the highlights that are included in the proceedings. Jonathan and Albert will then join Kathleen and share their personal reflections on the workshop and the topic more generally. We will then have a little time for questions and we encourage you to submit questions during the presentation using the Q&A function on this Zoom webinar. I would now like to turn it over to Kathleen Rest, the chair of the planning committee to get us started. Thank you, April. And thank you all for joining us today to further the discussion that we've been having around integrating public and ecosystem health to foster resilience and to move from knowledge to action. Ecosystems or nature, um, really they are our life support systems. They give us the food, the water, the air, the materials, the pleasures and the recreation we need to both survive and to thrive. The connections between people and their environments are under stress from human driven climate change, pollution, Resource, resource exploitation, and other actions that can directly affect our health. Because these drivers and these interconnections are so broad, the implications for public health are not really fully understood, um, characterized, or even appreciated. The gaps in understanding the interconnections between public health and ecosystem health hampers our ability to move us from knowledge to action. Next slide. To develop a workshop around this broad and co complex topic, the National Academies established a committee of experts with an equally broad range of experience and foci in their work. These included members from the public health, the human and veterinary and medicine communities, wildlife health, social science, biodiversity, ecology, and ecosystem services. And in addition, their knowledge brought experience, insight, knowledge. Uh, the committee also brought a lot of energy and passion, open-mindedness and humility, and commitment to the effort that has gone on for many months. 
The committee came together and bonded as a team, willing to listen, to learn, to respectfully grapple with questions from each other and challenges. The committee started as a group of people who really didn't know each other and evolved into a tight and mutually supportive team that became friends as well as colleagues. April, so next slide. The workshop was held uh, in September of 2022. Um, it brought together an interdisciplinary group of speakers and participants, researchers, educators, policymakers, and practitioners in public health, natural resource management, and environmental protection. The workshop provided a forum for knowledge exchange, including discussion and integration of traditional knowledge and Western science, discussions about barriers and critical gaps and successes, things that we need to know in understanding and practice, and then ideas for research that can help support development of policy and decision-making, the action. Next slide. Workshop attendees and speakers explored these issues over three sessions. Session one focused on what has been learned, drawing on existing intellectual frameworks that have been developed to address connections between public health and nature. The workshop brought together people familiar with these different frameworks to build on them in order to move toward developing a research agenda that generates actionable outcomes for implementers. Implementers, meaning policymakers, decision makers, public health and medical professionals, community practitioners, and other stakeholders. Session two focused on where progress can be made with emphasis on advancing transdisciplinary, community-engaged scholarship to integrate public health in nature and to inform policy and practice. Discussions covered different elements and relationships between nature and health. Really very exciting conversations from mental health and emotional health, children's health, uh, infectious disease, chronic disease, and access to life-sustaining resources. Discussions also reinforced the urgency of taking this integrated approach to manage the health of nature and the health of people together. We also discussed the importance of moving beyond the linear reductionist and reactionary scientific paradigm that undermines a lot of Western science in order to tackle the complexities of these interconnected systems and advance an integrated approach to policy and practice. Session three explored how we could go about crafting a research agenda to translate knowledge into policy and practice. Participants discussed barriers to making progress and ideas for overcoming them. Next slide. The proceedings provides detailed accounts of the speaker's remarks, as April said, and associated discussions, but we wanted to share some of the highlights with you today. Next slide. And again, this is kind of a big overview here. The proceedings highlighted the existing knowledge of the connections between nature and public health. We know, for example, that we rely on ecosystems for our health and our livelihoods and our well being. We know that our activities influence ecosystems and they circle back to affect us and our well being. Investments in nature can double as investments in public health, and conserving nature and natural spaces has broad public appeal. We also talked a lot about the fact that the environmental burden of disease is unequally distributed. There are great disparities. The connection between environmental degradation and detrimental effects on health are most pronounced in less developed and less wealthy nations. Next slide. The workshop also discussed how we value interconnections between public health and nature. We talked a lot about the global nature of the relationship 
and the value that healthy ecosystems bring to different stakeholders. People understand the value of keeping our air, water, and our agricultural practices clean and safe. And they understand that these things are related to our health. We also noted how indigenous traditional ecological knowledges or ITEC, those frameworks can, can, they do consider and value the health of animals, plants, air, water, land, and fire together. They are all considered sacred and are all valued as equal to human health. We also expressed concern uh, about silos, silos in meetings, in policies and actions that occur in our agencies, our health agencies, uh, ministries um, and organizations, um, health being separate, those discussions and meetings and forums often being separate from what's happening in the other, health and environment uh, not talking much together. Next slide. The workshop participants shared how a research agenda to address knowledge gaps to inform action, what it could or should look like, noting that it's important to consider both the what of the research questions that are being asked and the how of how the research is being done. Embracing knowledge production practices that generate actionable and decision ready information that involves the right people and is delivered to the right audiences at the right time. And participants also cautioned that there's a danger in prioritizing economic growth above all else, and that the reductionist scientific approach hampers our ability to integrate concerns about health and nature, human health and nature. Natural systems have emergent properties that make it challenging. They self-organize, they adapt and interact dynamically with human systems. The reductionist approach can misconstrue, miss or obscure important interconnections. And we also talked about the need to address the historic inequality in research that is being done and being supported across other countries. Next slide. In discussing the challenges in moving from knowledge to action, the workshop participants acknowledged that recognition and understanding of the connection between human and ecosystem health has done little to overcome entrenched institutional and structural barriers that reinforce inertia and the status quo and the prevailing incentives that keep environmental health interventions largely siloed. This inertia is not necessarily for a lack of understanding of the problem, but because there is a lack of incentives, capacity, and decision-making tools to operationalize the necessary solutions. We also noted that prioritizing environment-related issues are challenging in daily practices for public health and healthcare professionals, given the other urgent issues that they have to face and the limited amount of time that they may have. Next. We identified some opportunities for moving from knowledge to action. These included creating and promoting an inspirational agenda and vision, aligning health and environmental policies, and considering the environmental determinants of health, as well as the social determinants of health that people talk about. Developing a portfolio of indicators that link data streams on public health and environmental change. Doing this would enable policymakers to connect action plans for public health with action plans for sustainable resource management and conservation, and then measure progress towards meeting those policy goals. Next. And I, I would say also that we talked about the fact that some solutions are already at hand, 
it's often a matter of adapting and implementing them and investing in them, investing with the necessary capacity at the global, national, and local level. And finally, our work workshop touched on approaches to overcome barriers to generate knowledge and to integrate public health in nature and to inform policy and practice. Overcoming these barriers includes integrating social and cultural contexts into research, investing time to build relationships and credibility with government officials in order to better translate science into interventions, and this takes time as well as commitment, and then building key partnerships with local communities. And to support all of this, providing incentives to academia to train, encourage, and support, and, re and reward boundary crossing students and faculty, those that do cross disciplines. A number of speakers also noted the very, um, the high importance of training the next generation of students to do research that is impactful and not just publishable. Next slide. So as even with these few minutes, you can see that this workshop covered a lot of ground and it touched on many issues that we've only just begun to unpack and reflect on. Next. I'd like to now welcome my fellow committee members, uh, Jonathan Slayman and Albert Coe, um, to add to the discussion and to share some of their reflections on the workshop and this topic more generally. And note that these are personal reflections. They don't represent the position of the full planning committee. They may not have, you may not see them in the proceedings. These are their personal reflections. We wanted to bring them together to share them with you. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan. Thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Jonathan Sleeman. I'm the center director with the US Geological Survey's National Wildlife Health Center. And I was very fortunate to be a member of this organizing committee for this workshop. So I'm gonna reflect on a few things that, that I took away from, from uh, the work that we did together. And I'm gonna probably echo a lot of, lot of things that Kathy said, but kind of, like, kind of one of the key points that came out immediately at the start of this workshop was the fact that human societies are facing several and overlapping crises, including climate change, loss of biodiversity, social injustice. And the speak, many of the speakers conveyed that whilst um, the, the time to address these has not passed, these are very much urgent issues. And the time is now for us to really look, look for solutions and, and how to translate knowledge into action. As Cassie men mentioned, I, I think it was, it was, it was um, obvious to me that there's a fair amount of body of evidence regarding integration of public health and, and, and environmental or ecosystem health. Uh, the benefits of doing so, that um, some of the potential solutions, but uh, there were a number of barriers that were that were uh, mentioned during the workshop. Um, you know, one of them was lack of clarity and, and, and a common language on, on how we talk about these issues. Um, as, as Kathy mentioned, the disciplinary silos that that exist, um, lack of funding opportunities to do trans transdisciplinary work in this field, as, as well as incentives to to do so. I think Kathy mentioned the reductionist approach and the occasion, you know, obviously occasional lack of political will. But one thing I, would, I think I really want to emphasize is kind of the, it was consistently raised across all three uh, sessions was the structural barriers that exist to integrating public and ecosystem health. The political and econo economic systems that we have hinder the integra integration. They don't account for the value or the contributions the ecosystem uh, services provide. And consequently, consequently, create these per perverse incentives, uh, vested interests um, that, res that result in resistance to any change, um, and also result in unintended consequences for environments. Obviously, we don't not accounting for impacts on the ecosystem and the environment and nature in the decisions. Nature is is, is bound to lose out. I think, though, for me, the power of the workshop was really the focus on solutions. Um, and there's a lot of discussion out there about these problems, but what we really tried to hold down is uh, and focus on the solution. And I just want to give you some kind of examples that I heard during the workshop. Um, obviously, uh, there's a lot of discussion about engaging local uh, and indigenous communities, 
as well as decision makers on the outset of, of, of projects to ensure that all the voices are heard in crafting the solutions. We had presentations from a project called Health and Harmony that's using what they call radical listening to ensure local uh, community participation in any sort of outcomes from, from policy decisions. We had presentations about best practices for how to engage local indigenous communities in, in, in projects and, and ensure that you know, everything is um, work is done is culturally sensitive. Uh, others talked about systems, using systems thinking or systems approaches to get past this reductionist approach and, and kind of look at the big picture of what's happening within a system to understand the root causes of these problems that help hopefully reveal uh, new ways of thinking about these problems and new solutions. Uh, Kathy mentioned about the need to invest in, in both public health and environmental health systems. We had a presenter talk about you know, current public health uh, offices and agencies that got you know, HIV, tuberculosis, obviously COVID-19, mental health issues, uh, drug addiction, and how do they find the time to, to, to integrate or incorporate sort of environmental uh, health issues. And then finally, the sort of need to align the sort of the, the national international uh, health and environmental policies and align them together and create sort of inclusive governance structures that again allow all uh, um, participants to, to participate and thus ensuring that outcomes really do uh, maximize or balance the benefits for all. And I think again a kind of key theme, theme I'd like to emphasize is that um, there really was discussion about the need for a new narrative and how we address these issues and moving from an egocentric approach to an ecocentric approach. Now, the egocentric approach was discussed as where we, human societies, are regarded as a separate from nature, and nature is there for something for us to exploit for our, for our benefit. But as, as I mentioned earlier, that will often ignore the ecosystem services that contribute to the benefits to societies and, and health, and how we can actually end up fouling our own nest as a consequence of these decisions. And so the egocentric approach is very much uh, a way of, of looking at human societies as being part of nature, such that we consider the well-being and health of all living creatures and the health of the ecosystems, which we all depend, and hopefully allow for better decision-making that balances the needs of human, human societies, the, the environment, and, and the animals in which we all will coexist. And then there was also some discussions then about how creating some additional measures of success. So the normal way that we measure standard living is GDP, but can we start to create some other metrics that include the health and well-being of the biodiversity uh, ecosystems, ecosystem services? And actually, we heard um, from someone from, from the Office of Science and Technology Policy about the Natural Capital Project as one example where they are uh, attempting to put economic value or economic uh, 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 measure on nature and nature contributions to health. I think the final uh, thing I'd like to say about this work is, is, is it was um, a very rewarding experience. And I think our committee was an example of a successful inter interdisciplinary approach. We're a very diverse group. We're from different disciplines, different backgrounds. Um, whilst it took time and effort, I think through respectful dialogue, uh, 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 robust discussions, active listening. We built a common understanding of the problem and we, we went from having sort of separate perspectives to a common perspective and built that trust necessary to really make sure the workshop was as impactful as possible. And I think truly demonstrated the, uh, the power of our team. So I'd just like to end by thanking my fellow uh, uh, committee members and, and Kathy for our leadership as well as National Academy of Sciences for, for the support for this, this workshop. And I think I'll pass it over to Albert. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you, Jonathan. And I'm just going to pick up on a couple of points that uh, Jonathan made and emphasize them. So I think there are a couple of take home messages for myself and, and really valuable learning experiences myself as a, as a physician and also a public health practitioner. Uh, I think one of the central messages that really came out of this, this um, workshop was uh, the message of equity and equity not only in the outcomes that we were, were looking to achieve, but equity in terms of the process. And in uh, really the importance of grassroots initiative, not just the top-down academic or um, institution, you know, a gender-driven type of um, initiatives. And not only for the purpose of achieving the broad societal impacts that we 
that the workshop um, you know highlighted and Kathy actually went you know did a very nice job in elaborating, but also as a source of knowledge and evidence of solution, the importance of these communities, especially those most vulnerable and least resilient, uh, as a source of, of evidence and solutions and knowledge. Um, Jonathan mentioned the, the example of Canary Wet with Health and Harmony and the Radical Listening as one good example. Our own Shenandoah Billiard, um, you know, a committee member with her work uh, the indigenous peoples on the Gulf Coast, uh, along with uh, that really fantastic uh, session uh, that highlighted uh, Nicole Redverse and, uh, and new paradigms to thinking about ecos ecosystem and um, in public health. Uh, uh, we have our own Jeff, Jess Leclerc, um, a committee member, you know, who has been working with the Ho Chunk you know, Nation. And in uh, unheard voices, many times from uh, nurses and, and other pu public health practitioners. And finally, Jan Semenza on grassroots urban initiatives in Portland, Oregon, you know, to address issues you know, of climate change, but broader in terms of ecosystem and uh, nature and health. And so you know, the theme of innovative solutions being launched from bottom up and not just top down, I think was, was really a, uh, one of the highlights of, um, of the outcomes that came out. So what do we have to do to get to the next point? And uh, one of those, and, and how do we go on from what, what this, uh, you know, the, really the, the important outcomes of the workshop? One is really, I think one that we recognize is the importance of engaging policymakers, private sector, you know, the private sector, uh, whose voices we didn't really hear as much or should have uh, wanted to hear as much in this uh, workshop and also in other stakeholders in concretizing, you know, how evidence that incorporates the voices of communities can be used in service of those broader societal impacts that we, we aspire to. I think, you know, Eli Fenichel, who was at that time, you know, uh, part of the the, the Biden administration White House, you know, said, you know, laid out very nicely about the 15 year plan that was going to take the current agency based disorganized effort in the federal government and transform that into an integrated all government effort, you know, to develop core statistical pro uh, products all in service of this, the, of, um, of integrating ecosystem and pub in public health. Um, you know, I think one of the key outcome, uh, another key outcome of that initiative will be the call, you know, and, and which was the call of the action, call to action for the workshop was to create those structures that go beyond, above and beyond the interdisciplinary interagency connections, but also integrate community knowledge and voices in that process. So let me stop there and then go back to, to, to Kathy uh, for her, 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 closing highlights, uh, or thoughts on her highlights. So I'm happy to do that, but I would, before doing that, I'd like to invite another committee member who was able to join us today, uh, Rodolfo Durzo, um, to share your reflections. And then I'm happy to follow up with a few of my own. Rodolfo, can I turn it over to you? Yes, please. Thank you so much, Kathy. And it's, um, first of all, Kathy, thank you so very much for such a wonderful um, summary of the workshops and the many topics that we addressed and your summary was fantastic. Thank you so much. And I also want to thank Jonathan, Jonathan and Albert for presenting those beautiful reflections. And I have very little to other add because they also did a fantastic job in that. If I may, just a couple of things, perhaps. One of them from a more technical point of view and me being an ecologist, I wanted to emphasize that we in the workshops began to address also the question that you know, we tend to think of environmental challenges as one particular element or one particular factor in isolation of the others. For example, uh, uh, we tend to think about or to overemphasize sometimes climate change, but we began to explore in the workshop that climate change is important, but it's not the only one driver of change affecting our life supporting systems. Biodiversity loss is a critical one that we address very much so. Cultural diversity is another one that we began to explore. Actually, we spent some time addressing that topic as well. So I wanted to emphasize that uh, we tend to think in isolation in terms of each of the drivers, and then therefore in disciplines which are also isolated, but we need to phrase the challenge of bringing together those 
interactions and synergies that make the situation even more complicated than what, what Kathy described for us in, in her summary. I would be remiss not to bring back the point of, uh, of, um, of inequity that was uh, referred to by, by my colleagues and, and by Kathy. Really, as everybody knows, um, the contributions to the major global environmental changes that we see today are the, uh, are the lowest uh, by the people who are very much under very difficult conditions. Indigenous peoples, rural communities, they contribute the least, for example, to emissions of carbon and therefore to the global environment to change in terms of climate. But at the same time, they're the most impacted by those kinds of threats. So that recognition is central to our uh, dreams about sustainability. And I am so glad that we began to explore that and we emphasize the recognition of that significant aspect of inequity that is um, uh, affecting us very much and that is preventing our dreams or aspirations for sustainability of life and with human and planetary health. Um, I also wanted to um, uh, talk about uh, the fact of uh, perspectives of practitioners and traditional uh, communities that we had in the workshop. It is absolutely essential that we begin to learn from the practitioners and from the people who live in the systems and provide many uh, benefits for us based on the traditional ecological knowledge or traditional indigenous traditional ecological knowledge. Um, we are facing now a situation in which we're actually uh, having in front of us to deal with a process of double extinction, the extinction of biological richness of the planet, the extinction of elements of nature, and the extinction of culture. And we really need to pay attention to the traditional communities that have provided and provide, continue providing so much of those critical elements of, of life for us. And then um, I want to close by saying the uh, question of uh, uh, structural barriers. And we need to respond to those structural barriers, not only from the point of view of governmental institutions, but also from the point of view of academic institutions. I am very happy to report that Stanford University has created a new school for sustainability, Stanford Old School for Sustainability, in which the, uh, the dream, the aspiration is to bring together these different perspectives and we break the silos and we try and develop a sustainability science, which is much more horizontal and not so much in isolation. And finally, I want to say that it would be wonderful, Kathy, if we begin to think about creating a report that also would be engaging, transparent, and compelling to the youth, because I think the youth are going to be our best ambassadors going forward, and I very much hope that our experiences and our commitment to this, um, to this effort might actually reach also those communities uh, or, that are critical for society as well. So thank you very much, and congratulations to all the organizers, to you, Kathy, and to my fellow um, uh, co-organizers of the of, um, participants of the workshop. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Rodolfo and Jonathan and Albert uh, for those reflections. Before I give mine, I also, just so I don't forget, I also want to acknowledge the incredible staff team that we had at the Academy for this project. Um, they were there so well organized, uh, keeping us together, keeping us going. April, Audrey, Julie, Kyle, others. Um, anyway, you deserve a, a big round of applause and thanks from everybody on the committee. But so, you know, during the, the, the workshop coming from myself, coming from the public health community and looking back over so many years at so many preventable incidents and problems, I couldn't help but think about prevention. I taught in medical schools and departments of preventive medicine. I couldn't help but think about prevention and the precautionary principle, which is a concept that's fairly well recognized in the public health, occupational health, environmental health uh, community. I kept thinking about precaution and a precautionary approach. So, you know, it, it's clear that unfettered economic growth and industrial activity and some human activity are adversely affecting nature and people. But too often our policy makers and our decision makers um, come too late to the party. They've waited for harms, problems, crises or disasters to occur. 
before attempting to take action. And they, they react um, often too slowly and not always optimally. A precautionary approach to policy and decision-making can mitigate and perhaps even avoid some of these future harms. This precautionary approach encourages policies that protect human health and the environment in the face of uncertainty. It means taking prevent, preventive action even if there is scientific uncertainty, even if there are some deficiencies in our knowledge or there's some contradictory evidence out there about risk. It also means shifting the burden of proof from the proponents of the activity um, rather than just saying to the affected community, well, show us, prove to us that it's harmful and then maybe we can do something. It also means weighing the impacts of taking versus not taking action, regulating versus not regulating. It involves exploring a range of action alternatives and their distributional impacts. And it requires increasing levels of public participation and decision-making, especially for those who are or will be most affected and those who have been marginalized from um, having this access in the past. So again, my personal thoughts here, what stands in the way? Well, we have a slow, painfully slow regulatory process. We need regulatory reform. Um, coming from the occupational health field, you know, an example is that although ancient Romans knew that silica caused disease, it, is, it took the OSHA administration decades, decades to put out a silica standard. Another challenge, um, these agencies are underfunded, understaffed, under-resourced. There's unequal power distribution, unequal access, unequal influence, and there's entrenched interest in, this, in maintaining the status quo. We've also seen the manufacturing of uncertainty and doubt and how misinformation and money in politics can affect things. And that the problems and processes used to make decisions and take actions, we just need to look at them carefully. I'm not speaking against them. Um, risk assessment, it's a good thing, but do you really have to have significant risk in order to do anything? Cost benefit analysis could be a good thing, but does it always have to be that you have to show in monetary terms that the benefits outweigh the costs? Are there other ways of thinking about it? So what to do? Um, I, I've been in this for the long term, so I don't throw up my hands and no one on the committee threw up their hands. Uh, and no one, none of the participants did either. People were pretty hopeful about all kinds of things. But what we heard was, you know, it's really important to give voice to people who haven't been heard. It's really important for people to weigh in uh, with their policy makers, with their decision makers on what they're doing and what they're not doing and what needs their attention. Um, really important, I think, to support regulatory reform. And I would just say, get out and vote. <laughs> That's what people need to do. So with those were those were my personal reflections. Um, I will now turn it over to you, I think, April. Thank you all for providing the highlights and your reflections. I think this really added to the rich set of materials that the proceedings contains. Uh, we now want to open it up for some questions from, from our attendees. If you have a question and haven't already done so, please submit it through the Q&A function in the Zoom webinar, and we'll be taking the questions that way. Um, to get us started, the first that we saw come in was, what has changed in scientific institutions such that they're now recently recognizing the limits of reductionism? Someone like to take that one? Jonathan, you're muted. I'm muted. You think I'd have figured it out by now. <laughs> um, yeah, so I can, I can reflect from at least my own scientific institution. And, you know, it came from a lot of sort of environmental scanning that we did, horizon scanning and strategic planning, and, and recognizing that 
many of the disease issues that, that emerge from wildlife populations have these large scale uh, environmental driving drivers, uh, be it, you know, as we talked about climate change, changes in land use, um, pollutants and contaminants. And we, so we recognize that if we could address these issues at the root cause, um, rather than just describing um, the consequences, we really need to form multidisciplinary teams. Uh, we need to do experimental microbiology. We needed to have folks with, with modeling expertise, the, the, the field component. So it really was uh, through those, those, those types of efforts we, that, that we recognized that we need really to shift the type of science we did from, you know, single siloed approach, these multidisciplinary disciplinary teams. Um, the only thing I'd add to that is, is actually, I think it's interesting enough, it's, it's put an increased emphasis on the need for softer skills among scientists um, to have that sort of ability to work in teams, negotiate, um, uh, re resolve conflicts. But that's my perspective. Thank you. Rodolfo, would you like to build on that? Yes, please. And, and thank you, Jonathan. I think that's fantastic. It, it seems to me that this is, uh, this is a critical time for academic institutions such as universities to take the, this, um, this message that we hear so uh, clearly now that we cannot continue being in isolation and academic institutions can play a significant role there in terms of the training of the next generations of people who are gonna be addressing these issues. I, I, I can mention, and I already insinuated the fact that Stanford has created a new school for sustainability in which we believe that bringing the emphasis for the scientific community, the emphasis that, and, and contributions that are so critical from the human and social dimensions into the training. I think that this is absolutely essential. That school is, is actually bringing those elements to it. And there's also some educational programs at the PhD level at this moment. This is a program that we have in Stanford that is dedicated to bring the training at the, at the graduate level, considering not only the uh, STEM uh, uh, perspective, but also the human and social dimensions. I don't think we can address these problems critical for the functioning of our planet and for the life supporting systems that we depend on if we do not bring the social and human uh, dimensions. And I, I, I am hopeful that academic institutions, governmental institutions, and many other um, entities are going to be uh, embracing this critical need. Thank you. All right, another question that came in asks why are natural ecosystems not declared as nature-based assets of local city administrations? Could you comment on um, what benefits you think this could bring or important considerations and challenges that may preclude us from doing this right now? Kathy, would you like to take this one? Well, <laughs> I was thinking about how to respond to this. Well, first of all, the, the questioner is right. They should be, we should be thinking about the, the assets that nature brings to all of us, to local communities. So, you know, what is stopping it? You know, I think, you know, concern about cost, um, capacity, resources to do it. Um, you know, and, and we did during the workshop talk about the fact that we need to be, we need to be thinking about the, in, even in economic terms, sort of the, the, the monetary benefits that we get from keeping people healthy because we have, because we've invested money, spent money to keep our water safe, to keep our air clean. Um, you know, I think we heard from some of the workshop participants who talked, you know, very eloquently about local initiatives that have made a difference in children's health and children's emotional health. We heard about the value of green spaces. Um, and so thinking in that way, I think could help. Anyway, I see Jonathan has his hand up, who's probably going to answer this question much better than I did. No, no, at all, Kathy. I think you hit some key points. I was just going to expand on, on one thing you said, and I think it relates back to the structural barriers that we talked about and the fact that the sort of nature-based assets, as the, 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 the question 
implies that they're not measured. There's no metrics where which a city administrator can can take and say, okay, well, this is the value of me placing a natural area in the, in, in our city here. Or, you know, the, as as Kathy mentioned, the the mental health benefits from having access to nature, the you know the other contributions that area could take. So when they're coming to city planning or any other sort of planning activities, it's hard for them to actually consider them in in, in the overall decision making because they can't really account for it as compared to other other components and so that's why i think this these efforts to put as kathy mentioned um some sort of value to them some sort of metric to them so, so it can be integrated into the into decision making i think it's going to be a critical effort moving forward thanks rodolfo did you have a comment you wanted to make on that to complement what Kathy and Jonathan have said, um, Kathy mentioned the case of the significance from the point of view of the economic element of, of keeping those those systems. Um, there's a, a big area in in conservation science, and actually in general now it is percolating increasingly in the thinking of society, which is the ecosystem services or so the uh, benefits of nature to people. That includes you know, the quality of water, the quality of air, we eat biodiversity, we depend on biodiversity and so on. But I want to emphasize also the cultural inspirational and health value of keeping those elements of nature um, accessible to people from all works of society, including the underserved communities. It is absolutely essential. Now we are beginning to see things such as what is called eco grief, uh, environmental grief, those kinds of issues that are so relevant now for our stress societies. And so I think that investing intellectually and uh, also politically uh, looking for uh, policymakers and looking for government officials that are uh, willing and committed to keep those elements of nature available to society, I think that's a critical element that we need to be paying attention to going forward. Thank you. Our next question is asking about cultural differences between disciplinary areas. And I was hoping someone could comment on this. Um, environmental experts come from many different disciplines and also don't always share the same assumptions. Would someone like to comment on that? I mean, aside from saying true, true. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, we talked about the fact that sometimes we don't even use the same language. Um, we describe or look at things in different ways. Jonathan and Albert, Rodolfo, please add. I think Albert is, is ready to go and then maybe if necessary, I can follow up from him or Jonathan. Yeah, I think, um, again, uh, I, I'm not going to add much to the objective response of Kathy saying it's true, true. And, and it was actually interesting as a process uh, for this committee. Uh, I think we spent many months in sessions really trying to get, you know, understand a common semantics, getting a general definition, which is so critical in terms of communicating ideas, but also th synthesizing ideas. So there are issues of equity, you know, resilience. I'm just going back to some of our Jamboard items, but you know, equity um, leveraging means very different things across uh, different disciplines. And, and I think that gets back to some of the early the earlier question about, you know, why is it so difficult for us to implement this at the local city level? Uh, and it also certainly highlights many of the challenges we had during the pandemic about how we can take these different definitions, which mean different, uh, um, different things to different people and put them into a common language so that the, you know, the sanitation you know, officer at a local municipality you know, or the forest ranger you know, can put, put this, not only you know, put this in action, but also contribute to the process of generating knowledge and, and, and solutions. So uh, uh, an important question, this is an ongoing process. I would just say there are a couple of key steps in this. And one of them is, is really, uh, you know, again, I think we had a talk during the, um, what do you call it, uh, the proceedings, I think were just wonderful redaction of, of, of these debates on, on general definition semantics 
you know, the, the challenges of between different silos and cross different disciplines. But I think one of the, you know, there is a solution and several solutions at different levels. Obviously one which was, you know, um, raised was from the Biden, uh, Biden uh, White House about getting common statistical products ones that will take whatever what evidence is available about the impacts of, of um, nature-based or ecosystem-based uh, interventions and translating it to what's, you know, its um, impacts, you know, on, on hum human health. So there is a framework. Now our job or the job certainly of the next generation, I go back to Rodolfo, you know, in his comments that we have to train, this whole process is not just preparing ourselves to do what we need, do, need to do now, but how do we train the next generation of, of, of people? And in really filling in the blanks or filling in the, the gaps in that. So there is a framework. And I think there's several, not just one framework, but there's many, several different frameworks that, you know, for solutions. And, and, and the question now is how do we get, build those, those links that, you know, uh, link not only disciplines, but agencies and so forth. Let me stop there. Thank you, Albert. All right, I think we have time for one more question here. Uh, first, a comment to thanking the organizers and committee members for this fantastic workshop opportunity. Um, and then they ask, what is next? How will the workshop catalyze future actions and investments? Rodolfo, do you want to start us off? Can I, can I start, April? Thank you. Um, maybe start by, by saying that, um, what we need to do is to contribute to this critical element of the problem, which is uh, spread the word, communication in effective ways. I think that um, these workshops were fantastic and we had a multiplicity of perspectives and angles and lenses that came into enriching the, the proceedings. But I think we need to make sure that society at large uh, becomes aware of what is at stake what can be done and what needs to be modified to a very significant level in the many different aspects that we discuss. So I want to emphasize the point of communication, communication, communication and sharing, making sure that this is transparent and attractive and engaging that people understand in general uh, what is at stake. We need to go out of, for example, in my field, we need to definitely go out of the academic sphere and share across different spheres, including the general public. And I want to insist again, uh, communicating also with the youth, with the younger generations. I think they're gonna be fantastic ambassadors for us to address these problems. And of course, they're gonna be facing these problems themselves directly. So communication, communication, and sharing, sharing, sharing. Thank you. Yeah, and actually I would very much echo what Rodolfo said and, and just give you, so it's something that the committee, we've talked about considerable length about how to ensure the momentum keeps going. Um, and so to give some concrete examples, what Rodolfo says, we're organizing panel sessions at conferences to, to, to continue to sort of convey the findings and, and, and kind of key outcomes of the workshop. We, we're gonna present some posters at conferences. We're in the process of putting together a sort of more kind of um, lay uh, or plain, plain written article for, for you know, newsletters again to, get, to increase the audience. but. This is where you could all, all, all help us too, is, you, you know, please, please feel free to distribute the, the proceedings that the, the free, um, send them out to colleagues. Um, I know success will happen if someone sends me the proceedings and says, hey, look at these proceedings, aren't they really good? And I know <laughs> that hopefully then it's been, it's been a good, good, good round of communication. So, so um, anyway, that's all, thank you. Yeah, and I would just um, echo what you all said communication, communication, dissemination. And as, as you said, Jonathan, those of you who joined us today are, um, you're in this work with us. You care about these things. Um, you, you can be ambassadors for getting people to think about it, to talk about it. Um, yes, share the proceedings, it's right there for free. But um, yeah, we're, we're committed. The workshop may be over, but I'll tell you this little group of people, we're not done. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. We're approaching the end of the hour here, so I think we can go ahead and and wrap this up. Um, I'm going to put up the 
proceedings link here again. You can use the QR code to link directly to it. This is available free of charge for you to download. If you have any questions about this activity, please feel free to reach out to Julie Lau and myself, and we can provide you more information. And I just want to thank our committee members again for joining us today for this discussion and for all of you that attended as participants. We really appreciate your interest in this work and um, look forward to seeing how this plays out as we move forward. Thank you.